Coolidge is the CISO at Segment in San Francisco, building holistic security and trust programs to protect customer data. Previously, she was at Twilio as Senior Director of Trust and Security. One of Colleen's goals is to advance the security culture past just having some infrastructure people doing it to creating a comprehensive program where everyone in the company feels ownership and works to improve the company's security posture each year. She believes that every customer deserves to have a security organization who's advocating for the protection of their data. She has been called a true advocate for customer security, and I'm excited to hear what she has to say. Please welcome Colleen Coolidge. Surviving a big security incident and emerging in one piece on the other side can feel like a miniature version of the year 2020. For me, 2020 has shaped up to be a completely unfun haunted house with zero exits. And while the danger, the loss, and the depression of a security incident is nowhere near actual 2020 scale, the way that the public, your company, or you treat yourself can feel like it is, for a short time anyway. My name is Colleen Coolidge, and I lead security at Bay Area Startups. Today we'll be covering, um, so first the relationship between vacations, holidays, and security incidents, and we'll take a look at an incident in my team and I have to deal with. Then we'll reflect on what a security incident feels like, what it can do to any healthy, happy team, and what we can do to crawl out of that hole. Next, we'll be talking about specific practical fight back tactics, ones my team and I have been using successfully. Finally, we'll broaden the conversation talking about how to support the security community around us. We all have security friends working at different places. So let's set the stage and start by talking about vacations and holidays. Ah, vacations, the holidays, not doing any stressful work. In fact, your only job on a vacation should be to relax. What these children feel is what we want to feel on our vacation. You just wanna be able to let go. But we're security people. And while others fully enjoy their time off, playing in the snow, savoring the end of their fun-filled day with a cup of hot cocoa, and then sleeping soundly, security people worry about incidents that destroy vacations and sow chaos at work. However, we all still weirdly plan on taking time off. I'm guilty of it myself. In fact, the days leading up to the time off, we even bring out all of our superstitious practices to protect that time off. We knock on wood a little more. We immediately chastise coworkers who make flippant, unjaded comments like, hey, it's pretty quiet this week. This, my friends, is leftover trauma for security people. For when we do take time off, there's this lurking fear at the base of our holiday enjoyment. And of course, we should have known there would be a giant security incident looming as we neared the sunny and beautiful home stretch of Labor Day weekend, 2019. Not because of the vulnerabilities that are on the list to get fixed, that list that every security practitioner carries on their backs, but because the timing was, quote, holiday weekend 2019, end quote. For those folks not from the U.S., Labor Day weekend is our last hurrah for summer. When the weather's warm, barbecues are fired up, beaches get crowded, and people, including security people, try to avoid work. A few on-call engineers are holding down the fort and working. But even when that on-call engineer is you, you still try to make plans with your family and friends after you do a bit of work. You just hope things are quiet. And for us, we were closing out a great week. Our ISO 2701 paperwork was done. I was making an offer to a candidate and we were making awesome progress on our quarterly goals. Then this happens. Have you ever had to write one of these bulletins and emails in your security career? Unfortunately, I've had to help write a couple of these in my security career. They're not really fun. Someone on our engineering team had their account taken over by an unauthorized user. 
this unauthorized user was able to look around and see information about how our business customers used our app. That user could see business contact and usage information. However, that user could not see customer and user information, but it still majorly sucked. One of the many lamentable points about this account takeover was that locking down these accounts more was already an agreed upon OKR for the upcoming quarter. We had a security story for it, but we were eight to 12 weeks too slow on mitigating that particular story if we're looking at the incident timeline. Digging into the bulletin a little bit more, well, we wanted to include details like when did we learn about this? Of course, over the course of a holiday. What data did it involve? Business contact data, business usage data. One important point to emphasize in the bulletin was with our business customers, there was no end user customer data, which is a very small win, but you know we'll take it. Going to the last part of the bulletin, we felt we needed to include a moving forward section to talk about our immediate steps and then our near-term steps to prevent this scary story from happening again. We decided against talking about more distant and future big security plans or that long-term remediation if only things fell into place and in one or two years later, because putting ourselves in our customers' shoes, it's just not the right time to talk about big plans. It's about time to rebuild trust. And talking about big plans right now, which just sound like a bunch of empty promises that nobody wants to hear instead of a concise near-term list to hold us all accountable. And a final note about security bulletins that you have to write for incidents. If your team ever has to write one of these, you'll know that it's an art. It's also a very chaotic experience. Imagine this, at least one representative from every involved team, think your extended security team, legal department, and probably legal department, including people from all over the world, depending on how public this is and where the information is, your PR team, customer success, engineering, and the exec team. All of them in one room, well, virtually nowadays, they have to review the language, the story, the order, the everything. Lots of cooks in the kitchen. Add that on top of having to deal with an incident. In any case, after this draft has gone through everyone's review and edits, and then everyone is mildly happy and unhappy with it, and it's ready to be published and sent to customers, it's not actually recognizable as the draft that your team originally wrote. So to recap the Labor Day holiday that we had last year, we all went from thinking we were going to enjoy the Labor Day holiday and a long weekend with lots of fun stuff that we'd all planned, to working on this incident and continuing to work through the long tail of each cleanup piece and every type of communication with everyone, including very angry customers who are disappointed that you've made a mistake. It seemed like all the pieces just kept cycling around and around. That's what it felt like, being inside of a whirlwind with the pieces flying by. Well, that's normal security incident mitigation and remediation. And when your security incident becomes public knowledge, this is what's going to happen. People agree about the uh, steps that are needed to resolve an incident like this, but people don't talk about the emotional and energy drain that, is, that your team experiences and the remediation needed for that. Remedi remediation here might look like hiring more people to spread the work around. <clears throat> forcing people to take vacations so that they can recover, um, addressing the mood of the company and your team in particular, rewarding teams who put in a lot of extra time and work, providing their favorite lunch or dinner or something else, and reminding them that we have mental health professionals to address feelings of anxiety, guilt, and burnout, which every security person experiences during this time. And also some remediation is that leaders should resolve to find ways to fight back, but more on that later. So you know what? No matter how bad any security incident is, how terrible it is, how much sleep you've lost, it always comes to an end 
and you will start having little bits of time to start thinking clearly once again. I think this can be a helpful exercise for those of you who weathered a large security incident. And for those of you who haven't yet, fair warning, I don't think I can 100% put you back to normal and into a functional state after this, but I will try. So let's dive in. Do you feel haunted by the specter of future security incidents because of previous ones that you've had? Or because you're very aware of where all the unaddressed vulnerabilities in your company are, and you're just waiting for these ticking time bombs to go off? Well, in your mind, bring up that big public security incident. And if you can, note down your feelings when you imagine that incident happening to you right now at the company where you work. Are you starting to shut down? Are you starting to sort of mentally move away from it because it's really uncomfortable and you can't sit with it? Well, would your coworkers shut down during this exercise, people who you need? These feelings that you're having are like what happens to you when you enter a nightmare, that haunted house. You feel cursed. You feel like you can't escape no matter how much you want to escape. You start reverting to a more primitive mode. For us, when this happened to us, we absolutely felt like the unluckiest security people we knew that we'd entered a haunted house and we couldn't get out. And we felt like we were all alone. No one was going to help us and the situation was gonna grow more dire by the hour and we just had to get through it. You can also feel like you're in this constant state of panic and you ping pong between mild panic and severe panic, depending on the hour, depending on what's uncovered during the course of the incident. You might start to feel like you're losing your grip on reality. For us, due to the heightened stress that we endured for many weeks, none of us were sleeping more than just a few hours a night. We had trouble concentrating during the day when we were at work. We doubted ourselves and our judgment. We felt depressed and we felt like we were very bad at our jobs. We definitely felt like there would be no survivors. You may feel like you're all going to be punished. Security scarlet lettered, wearing it on your chest. Or even worse, you know, this feels like it's a stain that can't be removed from your, your reputation, your team's reputation, and your company's reputation. Your customers are disappointed in you. How could you do this? Well, we definitely felt like the other shoe was going to drop for us and that something else scary was coming for us. Every single person working the incident somehow felt inexplicably personally responsible and we felt like there was no end in sight with all of the mitigations, the customer and internal comms, and all the process improvement changes that we needed to make and make quickly. The nightmare security incident itself isn't even the worst thing about all this. The worst thing is you remain in its grip, repeatedly suffering as its victim, and you can't fight back. It just beats you down. So it's important to recognize that there are near-term emotional and mental dangers from security incidents. You might be burning out in the security field overall. And that's terrible because we need each and every one of you. There's a shortage of security people. Please don't quit when this happens. You might be fearing the next incident so much that the effective steps aren't taken to deal with the next one. You're essentially hiding from it. And then another danger is not learning and growing from this experience. As terrible as it is, it is a valuable learning experience for everyone. And it is not the end of the world, even though it feels like it. So what you need to do is you need to break that fear cycle and eventually capitalize on all the bad things that happen. Yes, I said it. You are allowed to capitalize on all the bad things that happen. And we did eventually do that. But if you or your team are really damaged from the incident experience, can you just easily switch from being scared and mitigating to the offensive side? Is that even possible? No, you should not immediately jump to the offense. 
if your team or you is damaged and limping away from a security incident. Also, I, I thought I was gonna give us all a break from the intense and haunted imagery of the last group of slides, since we are moving into a, a more uplifting part. So you thought you could just go on the offense here. What were you thinking? You don't drain the cooked rice and then rinse the cooked rice, just like you don't rush into your ass kicking phase before you repair the emotional damage that the big security incident can cause you or your team. How effective can you or your team be if you're feeling tired, anxious, guilty, scared, or depressed? I don't know, but you're better off if you resolve some of that first. Now, I know there's this huge stigma against talking about one's own mental health in both Western and Eastern families. I know because I occupy both simultaneously. And I'm here to break that by stepping you through my own process, bolstering myself against security job pressure. And that pressure is the cumulative effect of incidents and other things that happen that slight a security person's spirit. So let's normalize this stuff by talking about it, shall we? Oh, and yes, there is an app for that. Actually, there are several. If you check out the Google Play Store or the App Store, there are tons of apps that can help you. You don't have to walk into a 1950s psychologist's office and lay on a couch. And nowadays, it's probably not safe to do that anyway. My employer happens to provide access to a mental wellness app called Ginger, which just happens to be the one that we use. But these types of tools are great for security people, particularly security people suffering from incident trauma. If your employer doesn't cover this, get a better employer. I'm serious. And before you start worrying about my mental health privacy, you should know that I don't care. There is way too much hand wringing and protecting going on that's preventing society and people who need help from moving forward like we all be able, we should be able to do. And outdated prohibitions and ideas really just exacerbate the problem. They keep us in the dark, they keep us a victim. So the following is my own experience and I'm happy to share the results with you. So I recently opened the app and did another mental health checkup. And it really is this easy. For those of you who feel mortified by the very thought of taking the first steps toward good mental health, you can close your bedroom door, you can bust out the mobile app, and you can do your check-in in the privacy of your own bedroom. This one is as easy as answering 16 questions by reading and clicking through. These Questions pertain to my level of interest doing anything over the past couple of weeks, as well as remembering how many days I felt down. It's been a challenging month, I'm not gonna lie. And these questions are about my mood, sleep quality and energy levels. And actually these answers are normal for me. They're, they're not really that much of a departure. It's just who I am. And these questions are about appetite issues, yeah, like asking about overeating or not eating enough. Um, and also feeling like a failure. Is that a feeling that you carry with you? And for me, unfortunately, that's a yes. Now, these questions are about having trouble concentrating, which I was a bit. And then there are questions about feeling restless or noticeably slower than normal. This one wasn't so pronounced. <sighs> yeah, small wins here and there. Uh, this question covers self-harm and happy to report that I'm okay here today. Um, the other question covers whether I'm experiencing feelings of anxiety or edginess. There are definitely a few days that I can re recall experiencing these feelings. Both of these questions pertain to out of control worrying. And I'd like to remind all of us that security people are in general just at higher risk for various mental health concerns and that we should pay closer attention to that. I would say that as a class of, of employees, we probably fit into this particular category, most of all. Sometimes I wonder whether the job makes us this way or whether the job attracts those of us who are already this way. And uh, before we joined security, we were just worrying for free. And <laughs> now we get paid for it. Both of these questions have to do with not being able to relax and feeling restless. 
in a post COVID world, I'm planning on taking a very long vacation so that the answer to this question on the trouble relaxing thing goes from nearly every day to not at all, or maybe even never again. This last question I was able to show um, asks about feeling easily annoyed or irritable. Now, I'm not really sure if that is specifically a mental health question. It just sounds like who I am as a person. Um, also sounds like a number of people that I know. So to me, it wasn't that helpful or insightful. And question 16, where there is a question mark, um, is not accessible to grab the results. As I was going through the app, the downside was, since it was the last question, I had to advance it and then go back so that I could see my tick mark. But since it was the last question, I instead saw this. It took me to my results page, <clears throat> which is almost instant gratification, which is the great thing about mobile apps. The results on this check-in make me think that this tracks with a lot of security professionals. The insights provided show that the anxiety I'm experiencing means it's nearly impossible for me to relax on a day-to-day -day basis. And while not on a day-to-day -day basis, I do experience feelings of failure. Honestly, I feel like I let my team down in important ways from time to time. I wish that I could shield them even more than I do, but sometimes, and even more so this year than other years, there are days where I feel like I am just hanging on. And outside of work, I'm not spending enough time with the people I love. My friends and family have noted that I'm spending way too much time at work and they're just hoping for that break that never comes. And that makes me feel guilty as well. So what I love about this app is it doesn't just leave you in a lurch with something you already suspected about yourself anyway. Sure, I know I have problems and I could be doing things better and I feel bad about how things are. In my case, it's prompting me to address my issues by keeping a positive evidence diary. It's saying when I'm experiencing these feelings, I have a tendency to over notice or only notice negative things in my life. It's like my negative mood is a magnet to notice only what's going wrong with everything and everyone. Unchecked, this is something that could just get much worse over time. For those of you who know me personally, you know that I have a strangely sunny disposition for the number of years I've been leading security, but this year is definitely getting to me. It's starting to diminish the sun just a bit. So to combat that, I've been capturing small, medium, and large successes every week. From a notebook that I keep near my work laptop where I can scribble notes, here's a selection of my favorite positive evidence diary entries over the last week. The first two are small wins that I associate with my work. I feel very guilty when I don't stay on top of the work tasks because primarily that's what I get paid for, stay on top of these tasks. The third one is something that I do for my relationships health. It's really important, security people Hold the people who love you very close. Treat them well. The fourth and fifth ones are wins that are associated with physical health and mental health. And in particular, the guided meditation for sleep has helped a little bit with some of my sleep issues. And I highly recommend that. And this week, I'm, I'm going to add here that I completed a recent check-in on the app. Woo Small win. Now that we're on the road to recovery from the security incident damage, we could be persuaded to start fighting back. Instead of remaining incident victims, our team really needed to ensure that we had an effective way to drive meaningful changes all the time and not just in starts and fits. Existing weaknesses in our security story that weren't fixed fast enough, you know, that's part of it. It's always a struggle to get everyone in the company on the same page that security is. But have you considered what your security asks, which are probably large, what they look like from a product team's point of view? They care about customer stories. And while engineers you deal with may understand the need to address a vulnerability without the context of a scary story, product managers, not so much. 
So give them the kind of nightmare story that keeps you up at night. Walk them through your scenarios. Why should you, a security person, be the only one worrying about the haunted house? No. In your scary stories, be sure to reference tickets. That's a big red marker there. Tickets should all link back to your stories. So the person who's scheduling the work for this friend, so probably not the person doing the work, not an engineer, or even the person who's doing the work, these folks understand exactly how that work fits into eliminating that scary story. There's nothing like being able to connect the dots for others. So you don't sound like a raving security person who wants everything fixed. You actually have a clear and concise story and show how everything is linked. People like that. And keep it going. Keep creating stories for everything that stresses you out. The great thing about these stories is you can create an entire collection and you can build related quarterly goals and themes off of all of them. In making these stories, absolutely make sure the collection has story material that will reflect your learnings from previous incidents, whether they're your incidents that you've had to deal with or other companies' incidents in the news. Think of it as journaling your fears and getting paid for working through your trauma. We do. You can continue using this collection to help teams drive multi-year roadmaps and make significant progress company-wide. Your company might even be proud enough of everyone's progress that they would ask you to prevent, present at their annual conference. As I mentioned earlier, insure tickets track this work. The tickets represent vulnerabilities and they are great because you can report off of them. So how did we do when it came to that? Well, it's not the fanciest system, you know, it's, it's just another spreadsheet, favorite tool of everyone. But we realized that creating tickets for our stores without reporting on their progress, without showing metrics of who's late and who's not, means that all the lights are still off in the haunted house. Stepping back a bit, it's not as though zero work was done in security before the incident happened for us. We'd actually done a lot of work in the relatively small amount of time that we were at the company. Education and security design reviews had been in place for a couple of years. The team layered in some help for eng teams in the form of automation to locate and help fix vulnerabilities at different layers of the stack. There was a, a big ownership push to figure out what belonged to whom. You know, there were things that made it easier for eng teams to keep on top of their vulnerability backlog. Those things did happen. But education, reviews, and tickets aren't enough. You have to turn on all the lights to see how the vulnerability backlog is being addressed department by department. You might be thinking from this screenshot that as soon as weekly metrics are put into a spreadsheet, vulnerabilities magically start to self-heal, but then you would be wrong because you know who is just as interested in you are in the state of your vulnerability management, your exec team, or they better be. Oh yes, they do have the time to read your carefully curated email, telling them exactly what they need to know and what part of the organization is struggling to meet its commitments for vulnerability management, AKA product quality, that's what it is. And this is something that we do weekly. You know who else should be just as interested as exec and vulnerabilities that could cause a public security incident? Your board. The security org at your company also has the job of ensuring the board understands the state of your company's weaknesses in plain language. Also, the board can help you with potential conflicts of interest. Maybe um, there's something going on with security's reporting line. Maybe there's something weirdly political. Uh, you know, who does security report to? Is it someone who's just trying to make themselves look good? Is your security messaging, your warnings, is all of that being squelched at any level? The board is obligated to hear you or your security orgs rep and provide help when management does not help you. Your security org should get an audience with the board if they don't already know what's going on. Make sure your message doesn't go through kind of like this Soviet era redaction techniques either. 
if you find that this is happening to you in your security org, since you have the strength now because you took care of yourself, you need to fight back. Or if you think the fight isn't worth it, find a better environment in which you can practice your security. More about that a little later. Going back to that same vulnerability management spreadsheet where we show metrics, you should notice that there are additional departments listed on here, not just engineering teams. So you'll see HR and finance and facilities. The security org cannot take credit for that. We're pretty good, but we're not that awesome. That awesome move of starting to measure security vulnerabilities in every department across the company was the idea of our CEO, Peter. He asked for this. He liked the weekly emails, the distillation and visibility so much that he asked us to start tracking all vulnerabilities in any department in exactly the same way. So we started tracking and emailing on those too. Hey, give your exec team some credit. Take time to break down the problem and the impact in a way that's transparent for them. Make it easy for them to ask clarifying questions and to make decisions. Remember, they are experienced and successful decision makers. They make big decisions all the time and you have a great chance of getting what you need if you explain security risk to them in real world terms. Break it down for them, that's your job. Now we're gonna start broadening our security point of view from just our teams and ourselves and our feelings <clears throat> to expand our point of view to people in situations in other companies, just sort of venturing out a little bit. We aren't alone in security and we shouldn't act like we are. Even though it feels like it, incidents are not your nightmares. They're just a long series of challenging tasks and sometimes very, very unpleasant ones that we get paid to and we must execute well. Always move yourself back to your mental and emotional center. And once you're there, help others get there. People are more effective when they're, I know it's not the right word, but when they're Zen, people are better at their job. Your security friends at other companies don't need your Twitter trash talk or frequent work interruptions. Hey man, what's up? I saw, I heard some news for you to spill the tea during that big incident. They need your empathy instead. They might even reach out to you for help asking in a generic kind of way that's not gonna get anyone in trouble. Help them and don't push them, don't put them in a situation where they have to lie to you. You know what was a, bra a bright spot for us? It's kind of odd, um, during our last incident. Well, our security friends at another small company in the Bay Area um, heard about what was going on and they sent us a very special set of incident cupcakes. <laughs> And this mattered to us because A, they weren't trying to siphon any juicy details from us and exploit us. And B, they probably knew that we hadn't eaten or slept in a while. And we definitely hadn't treated ourselves with something as tasty as cupcakes. Uh, this happens, you know that these security folks are friends forever. And security community. How many of us want to talk more openly about security incidents? how they came into being, how we moved through them, <clears throat> the impact or toll that it took. So we can learn from one another and improve faster. That's our goal, we're trying to get better. The group discussion feels better when there are Chatham House rules governing it. Well, why would you do this? This is about sharing wisdom and painful learnings with the goal of all of us improving. We all work in security at places where we have someone else's data or critical services. It's our job to protect that. Educating one another across companies <clears throat> is a way we can spread learnings across the world and improve security posture everywhere. So when the security incident isn't public knowledge, the guideline here is don't attribute details to people, don't attribute details to companies and don't attribute details to unique situations. We're here to learn and protect ourselves from the same situation from happening to us. Similar to the legal and regulatory community, which I'm not a part of, but um, security people are adjacent to. These are the folks who <clears throat> dictate terms and contracts. They influence laws, um, you know, 
our, our partners sometimes. How many of you can honestly say that you feel okay with us security practitioners talking about incidents and learnings in an open way with one another? We know you get nervous about a lot of stuff, not being a security practitioner, and you prefer to say no to us. You prefer that we don't go up on stage. You prefer that we don't dive into details. Even if the point of it is learning from incidents and practicing better security for our collective customers, can you change some things in your daily practice and in your own community to make it easier on us to provide great security? Can you use less problematic contract wording and terms? Can you standardize reasonable and situationally intelligent contract terms across the board? Can you rethink your checkbox behavior and overly punitive actions, which disincentivize the right kind of security action? Is it possible for you to think about spirit of the law and help us move toward a more blameless culture overall instead of where we are? Just putting this out there, if you really care about your customer security, instead of asserting paper power over everyone, you would work with us to achieve this goal of openness, safety, effectiveness, and we would evolve faster. And finally, security people, in case you aren't supported during, after, and way after an incident, just at any time, remember, good security people have lots of other options and a big community to help line up those options for us. Every good security person deserves to work in a place where they are believed, their work is respected, and security overall is empowered to do its job. If that's not happening, it's just like, you know exactly what I'm about to say. An option to work at a better company is a great option. If you're ready to jump, make sure that jump is to a place that has a heavy investment in security. They have a reputation for it. People will vouch for them. And that company listens to what security people have to say, particularly when it pertains to preventing or limiting the negative effects of large incidents. Word gets around about companies who treat their security people well. We have friends in all of these companies and our friends are just as aware as we are that good security people always have options. So we are all where we are, we're here because our companies listen to us and invest in our plans to make company, the company more secure. Bookmark and keep checking your favorite company's job pages because new security roles open throughout the year. You don't know. Maybe there's one listed and in two weeks there'll be six listed. So just keep checking back. But again, narrow your job search to the companies that actually take this seriously. Don't waste your time with companies that aren't gonna let you do your job. Well, if you're not ready to leave just yet, Maybe you're just kind of mad at your employer. Maybe you're just kind of mad at some of your employees. That's fine. You can join the InfoSec community on Twitter. You can check out the different lists. I belong to a few of them just because I've been on Twitter for a long time. You will find plenty of security people who will give you advice and encouragement when you need it. We are all doing a variation of the same job. And we may be able to give you better and more specific advice than your non-security friends. As you know, we appear to be a personality type. Or if social media plus 2020 for you is a big cup of no thank you, there are still online meetups for security practitioners where you can always connect with like-minded people and learn from them. Just be mindful of other security practitioners' time. Everyone is busy. So make sure that you use their time wisely when you're asking for help and advice and find a meaningful way to reward them for their help. Feed the community. I hope you've enjoyed the incident stories, the emotional reflection, tactical maneuvering, and suggestions to improve insecurity beyond the confines of our company's walls. Remember that you need to do everything you can to center yourself during and after a big security incident. Take those steps to recover before you and your team storm the castle. I sincerely hope the rest of your 2020 proves to be a hero story for you that you come out a winner. And if by chance it doesn't, remember that your security community can help you through some of that, even if it's just proper commiseration. Oh, and if you're eligible to vote in the US, remember to vote, it is October. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you. 
What a fantastic presentation. Thank you, Colleen. Unfortunately, Colleen is unable to be with us today for a question and answer session. If you've seen the news, you can understand. She's just a little busy. But don't worry, there's still plenty to do. Our virtual expo hall is open, as well as our other interactive activities. And we'll be back at noon with our final keynote presentation by John Stephen, as well as some closing remarks from our executive director. See you then.